hands this way and just ask the Lord right now if he would anoint me to speak the word today to bring this Christian Atheist series part four uh, to you the way that he would have me bring it to you. Lord, we just love you. <clears throat> Lord, I honor you and I surrender my heart and my life, my soul, as you know, to you, Lord. I want every part of me <clears throat> to speak this message for you today. Lord, I am totally inadequate and insufficient and can't do anything on my own. But if you will anoint me, God, if you will anoint me to speak, Lord, with power and authority and unction, God, if you will be the one that convinces today these people through your servant, through the words that you have me speak, I would be so appreciative. I ask you, Lord, to touch right now and anoint and uh, that we would live changed today. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe in God, but he's not fair. That is the words of so many Christians. Now, we have defined a Christian atheist as one who believes in God, yet lives as though God does not exist. And we've talked about that, and we've talked about I believe in God, but... I'm ashamed of my past, and we talked Wednesday night about I believe in God, <clears throat> but not in prayer. And today, I believe in God, but He's not fair. And you heard Tara just a moment ago say that in our life group, we have a number of people that are battling cancer. And so we're, we're praying together and believing together and asking God. So... I would say, I, I bet you, how many of you have had something happen in your life or somehow uh, uh, attached to you or associated with you that caused you to just say, this is just not fair? <clears throat> Amen. I believe if we're honest, all of us can say that, that something has possibly happened. Um, but I want to tell you something. People are fickle, and the way we think about things and the way we... Uh, express those thoughts can change rapidly. Did you know that? I mean, let me, let me give you an example. Dr. Ravi Zacharias, some of you know him, he's a great, great theologian. He tells a story of a man who had uh, gone to a horse show and had bought a beautiful horse at a great deal. And he brought the horse home and his neighbor come over and looked at him and uh, he explained the deal and his neighbor said, that was good luck. Good luck. And then the horse ran away. And his neighbor said, that was bad luck. Bad luck. And then the horse come home three days later with 20 more horses. And his neighbor said, that was good luck. Good luck. And then the, the owner's son was feeding the horse one day. And the horse kicked his son in the leg and broke his leg. And his neighbor come over and said, bad luck. Bad luck. And then a bunch of gangbangers from town and, uh, you know, the, the gangs come recruiting teenagers to go in their gangs. And they looked at his son and said, you can't go with us because you have a broken leg. And the neighbor said, good luck. So you see how fickle we are. It's, it's this and it's that and, you know, and God is love. And then if God loves me, why does he let this happen? And I, he loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. A bad thing happened today. My car wouldn't start. He don't love me. And then tomorrow you win the lottery and God loves me. Please pay your tithe. He does love you. <laughs> Obviously, some of us are very confused about, about God and about what is of God and what God just allows. What does God perpetuate or, or make happen and what he allows to happen? And I want to preface this message with telling you, because I can't possibly explain everything here, but I want to preface this by telling you that you and I do not live in a perfect world. Although we have been saved by a perfect God, we are flawed. We are not perfect. And since paradise, since Eden, uh, when, when humanity fell and mankind sinned and was driven out of the garden, perfection went away. 
We live now in a cursed world. You need to understand that. Thorns have infested the ground. Um, conception and childbirth hurts because of sin. In fact, the wages of sin, Romans 6 says, is death. Um, and, and, and death because of sin. We were not intended to die, and God's going to work this out. Because of salvation that happened at Calvary 2,000 years ago, God has given us a remedy and will rectify the situation. Are you hearing me? And for those who are saved in the end, we will live throughout the endless eons of time. You can't even fathom that. But, but I want you to understand that we are in a flawed world. But here's something else I need you to understand is this, that you don't need to understand everything. The old timers used to say it like this. I don't need to understand. That's what they said when they couldn't figure God out. I don't need to understand. I just need to Hold his hand. Yeah, some of y'all got it. I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. And then we all sang another song because we couldn't figure it all out. And we said, we'll understand it better by and by. By and by when the morning comes. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Now, I want to tell you, there is some truth in them old songs. For Paul did say right now we do see through a glass darkly. Right now we do not comprehend the depths of the knowledge of God. We do not understand why certain things happen and absolutely terrible things happen to wonderful people. For more than six years, Michael and Andrea dreamed of conceiving a baby. After several heartbreaks, finally they found a reason to celebrate they made it through the first trimester, and they began to look forward to the birth of this healthy baby girl. Suddenly, at the beginning of the third trimester, Andrea started contracting prematurely, so her doctors sentenced her to two to three months of bed rest. Even after all of the careful intervention and care that was given, Andrea gave birth to a three-pound, two-ounce baby girl. Emily Grace lived 48 hours. Um, Pastor Craig, a dad himself, said, My heart bled for him. My heart went out to him. And the mother finally broke the silence and she said to me, Pastor, please don't tell me my baby died for a reason. No one said a word for half an hour. We just held on to each other and cried. Nobody explained anything. No one could explain anything. And nothing could have softened the grief that this mother was experiencing at this time. People often say, life's not fair. And that is unquestionably a true statement. Here's what I need you to know today. I need you to get this if you don't get anything else. That pain, tragedy, and suffering are not new to Christianity. The old timers in the Bible understood what it was to be uh, abused. They understood what 430 years of slavery and making bricks in an Egyptian workhouse, they, a, a sweatshop, if you will, they, they, and they took away their provisions and demanded more. Our forefathers, our biblical ancestors, they were very much accustomed to hardship, to tragedy, to pain and suffering. It is only a Johnny-come-lately gospel that prosperity preachers have perpetrated that have told people that if you'll accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, everything will be hunky-dory and your ship is coming in and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That is foreign to the Bible. That is foreign to Christendom. Listen, I want you to understand something. We don't have to understand everything. For instance, there was a blind man. He was blind since his birth. Jesus saw him one day. And uh, Jesus, um, I believe it's when he spat on his eyes and he healed him. And then they began to question him. They brought, the authorities brought him and said, Hey, tell me about this man that healed you. What was he? A prophet. You know, was he a priest? Was he a man of God? Who, who was this man? 
And they really wanted to interrogate this blind man. And this blind man said, listen here, I don't understand, to tell you the truth. Whether he was a prophet, I don't know. Whether he was a teacher, I do not know. Whether he was a man of God, I don't know. He said, all I do know is that I was blind and now I see. Amen. You ought to give the Lord praise. But there are unexplained tragedies that make us want to scream, God, where are you at? And you are not fair in my life. How could you have allowed this to happen to me? How could this go on if you are God and you are righteous and you love us and you're sovereign? How can I suffer this if God's fair? Why all of the injustice in the world? If God's fair, why the tsunami and why Katrina and why pestilence and drought? Why all of these things? And we ask ourselves questions like that and it drives us crazy. God, are you there? Where are you at? It seems reasonable for the Christian atheist to conclude that that, 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 that God is powerless because it seemed like you don't have a whole lot of control over society or what happens and why is it that... But again, let me take you back to the Bible. The first counselor in the church was led to the edge of the city. His name was Stephen. And they stoned him to death right there. Might I remind you of John the Baptist, first cousin of Jesus, the forerunner of, uh, of the Messiah, that if anybody loved God, if anybody was honoring to Jesus, it was John the Baptist. But Herodias' daughter asked for his head on a platter, and she danced before Herod, and Herod said, let it be, and God didn't do one thing about it. They come and pulled him from his jail cell. They carried him to a guillotine and chopped his head off and she took it to the dance. There's his head on a platter. God, where were you at? I don't understand a man beloved, a man that ate locusts and wild honey and preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and pointed to the Messiah and said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Where were you at? Because his head fell off his shoulders into a basket. But I want to tell you something, you, and this is going to uh, astound some of you. Did you know that this life is not our be-all, end-all, everything? This life is a staging ground for eternity. What is 70 years? What is even 90 years in the scope of eternity which you and I cannot even comprehend or fathom? I submit to you that God was indeed finished with John the Baptist at that time. Let, let me move on. I want to press for some. The Christian atheist believes in God, you know, but not in prayer. They struggle believing that God answers prayer, so it's only logical that they conclude he is not making a big difference in this world. Let me share with you what happened in just a few weeks in one church in Oklahoma, in, in a few weeks. An innocent husband found out that his wife had been having a two-year affair with his best friend. A godly woman lost her husband to cancer and is struggling to raise all three children like doorsteps under the age of five. A young girl revealed that her father had sexually molested her for years and her father was a pastor. A couple's 17-year-old son fell asleep while driving and died instantly when his car struck a tree. Two parents lost their precious baby that drowned in their next-door neighbor's pool. All of this happened in one church, in one town, in one month. Where was God? God, you are not fair. So what I wanted to tell you is you you got to understand that suffering and tragedy and hardship is nothing new to the people of God. That is a fact 
that, that it goes back to the eons of time. Now, here's, here's why it's important for you to get the rest of this message and stay tuned with me now. Here's why you need to know that, because if you can grasp this message today, you'll be able to make it through whatever it is that life dishes out for you. But if you do not grasp this message today, uh, you'll always question God. And there's really nothing wrong with having questions, but you'll question beyond measure and even run the risk of losing your faith altogether in the midst of tragedy and becoming an apostate. So then, Pastor, what must I do? Here it is. You have got to understand that while there is pain, while there is tragedy, while there is suffering, God goes with us in our pain. God goes with us in our suffering. Can I tell you something? When, when, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, and they took them away uh, to the river Tibar. I want to tell you something. The Bible says that God went with them in their suffering. God went with them in their exile. Can I tell you while we are pressed under a heavy load, God is still with us. When John was banished to the island of Patmos, God was with him. He said, for I heard the Spirit on that day, and I turned to see who it was, and the Lord was with me. The Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God goes with us in trouble. No greater illustration could I give you than when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not delivered from the fire, but Nebuchadnezzar looked in and said, didn't we throw three men in the fire? Yeah, we throw three. He said, but there's four men, unharmed, unloosed, and walking down there, and the fourth man looks like the Son of God. Now, I don't know how Nebuchadnezzar knew what Jesus looked like because he hadn't been born yet. I'm telling you it was a divine revelation from God that God goes with us in the tragedy. Lord, help me. I need to move on. I need you to understand that God goes with us. Craig gave us an illustration. Craig Rochelle said, my hero was my 78-year-old grandmother. He said, I loved her to death. She mentored me. She was, and I could identify, uh, you know, uh, I had both my grandmothers, both my grandpas was dead before I was born, but... He said, my 78-year-old grandmother uh, had a stroke on her way to the bathroom one morning. She lived by herself. She slipped and fell in the bathroom and laid there for three days. Three days laying on the bathroom floor. Where was God? Why did my grandmother who loved God, that taught me to love God and tithe and taught me to tithe and all the things, where was God when grandma was lying on the floor in that bathroom? There she is in great uh, pain. He said, I'd love to tell you that it was part of a great grand design. I'd love to tell you that grandma shared her faith with a nurse that gave her heart to the Lord or to a doctor. I'd love to tell you that she got healed and was recovered, but the truth is she never recovered. She was partially paralyzed the rest of her life and six months later died. He said, but before my grandmother died, I had to ask her what she thought about while she was laying on the floor. She said, Craig, I've never been closer to God in my life than when I was laying on that floor. I've never been closer to God in my life than when I laid on that floor. Let me tell you something. We can't explain all the tragedies of life. I can't. But I'm going to tell you something. When I was a very young minister, about 23 years old, 22 years old, I was just, just credentialed, just, and I hadn't, you know, preached a, 10 messages maybe, and the overseer asked me to be the interim pastor at a good-sized church, around 180 people on Sunday morning. I was elated and scared. And I studied around the clock to preach and whatever, but we had an old man, and he really wasn't old. He was in his uh, maybe late 50s, early 60s. Harvey Montgomery was his name. Loved the Lord, loved the Lord. Had cancer, had, uh, had brain cancer, had uh, heart, all kinds of issues. But nonetheless, I went to work. I come home from the Air Force Base that day, 
My wife had fixed hot dogs. She already had my plate. Two of them were fixed, chili on top. There's the glass of tea. Everything's ready to go. And the Lord spoke to me right then and said, go to the hospital to see Harvey Montgomery. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to go as soon as I eat these hot dogs. No, no, no. Go now. I, I said, well, what's the hurry, Lord? You know, that's kind of how our mentality is. And I'll eat and I'll go. And I was so prompted, go right now. So I left. I said, honey, I'll be back. I got to go. I got there. His daughter was at his feet. Another daughter at his head, his wife by his side, holding his hand, saying, Daddy, honey, you can go now. You've suffered long enough. They asked, they said, Pastor Mike is here and he's come to pray. I prayed with him and said, Amen. When I said, Amen, the largest smile come on his face. And he left this world and went to glory. It was an amazing thing for me. Amen. But you know what? That old corruptible body ain't hurting no more. That old body that is flesh, corruption has put on incorruption, and mortal has put on immortality. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, in our sick, maimed, hurt bodies in this life, we shall be changed and made whole in that life. And when you have a real spiritual moment and you really get close to God, your eyes of understanding and enlightenment seem to open up. And then when you get back to work Monday, you start saying, man, I'd sure like to stay here a thousand years. I know how it works. Let me tell you about a man. His name was Job. I wish I had time to tell you all. But suffice it to say, he was the richest man in all the East. The Lord, because Satan was wanting to, to mess somebody up. You, can you imagine? Yeah. He's wanting to mess somebody up. And the Lord God said, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, and he's an upright man. He loves God and he fears me and he, he hates evil. And, and the devil says, but you know, if, if you let me touch what he has, he'll, he'll, he'll deny you. The Lord said, have at it. And then all of a sudden, one day, the Bible says in Job chapter 1 verse 13, Job's sons and daughters are having a feast. Uh, excuse me, let me back up. Um, uh, a servant comes in and says, all of your animals are gone. All of your camels are gone, all of the asses, all of the oxen. And I mean, I, I'm trying to shorten the story because one servant on the heels of another. All of these cattle are gone. All of these herds are gone. All of these flocks are gone. And finally, the last guy comes in and says, hey, I got bad news, Job. <clears throat> your children were having a party. And the wind came and hit the house. It fell, and all ten children are dead. They're dead. And Job says he knelt on the ground and he worshiped God and said, We bring nothing at birth and we take nothing with us at death. The Lord alone gives and takes. Praise be the name of the Lord. And then the devil come back to God and say, God, uh, and, and God says, where you come from? He said, walking in the earth, seeking whom I may devour, trying to destroy. And he said, well, did you consider Job? And, well, yeah, I did touch him. And, and uh, I took all of his things, and, but he still maintains his integrity. But the devil said, I'll tell you what, God, if you let me touch his body, if you let me get under his skin, he'll curse you to your face. The Lord says, okay, have at it, but you cannot kill him. Immediately from head to toe, he's stricken with boils, oozing boils. And uh, it's horrible. And, uh, I mean, it's just amazing, uh, horrid smell and the, the itching and the burning and it, all of that. And uh, finally, he, Job, he curses the day that he was born. Oh, God, blot out that day of my birth and the night that the, my parents created a son. Forget about that day and covered in darkness. Send thick, gloomy shadows to fill the dread. Erase the night from the calendar and conceal it with darkness. Don't let children be created or joyful shouts be heard in that night. But let those who have the power curse that day. Darkness in, uh, it darken its morning stars and remove all the hope of light because it let me be born into a world of trouble. Why didn't I die at birth? Why didn't I 
I die at birth? Why was I accepted and allowed to nurse at my mother's breast? Now I would be at peace and in silent in the world below. The kings and the advisors whose palaces lie in ruins and the rulers which uh, once rich and with silver and gold. He said, if I had been born dead and buried never to see the light of day. He lost everything he had. Let me just say, he had had it with life and he'd had it with God. He's got to understand you. He begged for a trial with God. And he said, God, I mean, this, it's just not fair. I, I just wish I had never been born. If, if all I'm going to do is acquire wealth and then you took it from me, had ten children, you've took them from me. But he still acknowledges that you are God. Now, if you read the back, the very last part of Job, I believe it's chapter 42, you're going to find out that he's going to have twice as much of every kind of animal that he had. Before he died, he had twice as much as he ever had. It's amazing how God restores. But let me say this. Here's what you've got to do today. You've got to understand that God is going to go with us. And if God goes with us, we can make it through anything. David used to pray when he was looking at his enemy, shall I go up and fight? And he would say, Lord, if you'll go, I'll go. But if you won't go with me, I won't even go. I'm telling you this, if we'll lean on the everlasting arms, there's another old hymn, if we'll lean on the everlasting arms of the Lord, he will see us through our darkest hour. Let me, let me try to move forward. So, um, you got to get this. First of all, I, I, wanna, I need to answer this question. And I'm trying to land this thing for you. We ask the question, is God fair? Let, let me show you a scripture. And I'm just going to quote it because I don't have time, but it's in Matthew 20. There was a farmer that went to the corner in town where people would wait for someone to come by and pick up workers to go in the field. Everybody would gather around on this corner and a farmer would come by and if there was ten workers out there, he might get five of them, he might get all of them. Well, he come by and he got some early that morning like sunrise. He got several workers and he come and put them in his field and they're working. He went back six, at the sixth hour and there were some more standing there, he come and got them. He went back at the ninth hour, got some more, put them in his field. He went back at the eleventh hour and got some more and put them in his field and they all worked in his field. And when he got ready to pay out that day, the guys that got there at the eleventh hour and the ninth hour and the six, he handed them a denarii, one penny. He handed them. And those that had been there all day long were thinking to themselves, well, I'm probably going to get a dollar, you know, or at least a nickel. I've been here all day. And so he gave every single one of them a penny. And they said, wait a minute, how is it that what is fair about this God that, that, that we've been here since daylight, they got here at the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the eleventh hour, and you have given them the same thing you've given us? And he says, listen, don't let my generosity be evil spoken of. My wage for you that you agreed for was one penny. If I want to pay those who was here this long the same as you, that's none of your business. I choose to be generous and give them as much as I was paying a man to work all day. You following me? So, is God fair? Then we have the prodigal son. The prodigal took all of the living that had come to him. He wasted it. He squandered it in riotous living. He found himself in a hog pen, and then he come back home. And when he got back home, the father said, go get the shoes that I bought. Go get the ring that I bought. Go get the robe, and go kill the fatted calf. So let me say this. We ask that, is God fair? And I submit to you, no, God is not fair. Because if God was fair, you and I would be in hell tonight. Was it fair that he who knew no sin became sin for you and I? Was it fair that he that had done, never done nothing wrong in whom no guile was found in, that he would be uh, smitten and stricken and beaten and eventually killed for us? The innocent dying for the guilty. Is that fair? No, that is not fair. Well, let, let me go on. 
You see, John the Baptist, was it fair that he died the way he died? No. It don't seem like there's no fairness in that to me. Uh, you know, I, and now let me say this. I hope, I, I sure thank God that he's not fair. Let me show you what he said in, in Psalm 103, 10 through 12. God does not pay us according, or God does not repay us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as, the high, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. It is a good thought from our perception that things must always be fair. And I know... Some of us have the mentality that all of our, everything's got to be so fair. It's, and that's why everybody gets a trophy now, no matter if you can play football or not, everybody gets a trophy. It's ludicrous. I'm telling you, it's stupid. I'm not saying that you shoot your kid in the head. I'm not telling you that you, that, that you tell him he's nothing. I'm simply saying that we have to reward excellence. If you think that an employer is going to give somebody who's half doing a job the same thing he's doing somebody that's working overtime all the time, you're crazy. We reward excellence. We should reward excellence. So, but, but we live in this world of fairness, but I'm going to tell you, God's not fair. He's not, because if he was fair, you and I would be dead. If we got our just, he's just but he's not fair. Now, I, I'm trying to move on because, see, the wages of sin is death. And, and, and the Bible says, Romans 3 and 23, you've sinned, and I've sinned. But God commended his love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ still sent his son to die for the ungodly. Is that fair? Nope. Is it fair that God Almighty had to turn and look away as his son took upon himself the sins of the world? And Jesus would cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did Jesus want to? Why did he pray in the garden, Lord God, Father? If there's any other way possible that I can redeem our creation back to you, if there's any other way, oh, let this bitter cup pass from me, but nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. Is it fair that he had to sweat blood for us? But he did. Was it fair that Jesus faced a mob of soldiers and a mock trial with no justice and a beating beyond recognition of mankind and eventually crucifixion? Nobody ever received scourging and execution, but he got both. Was it fair? No. So as you stand with me, I want to tell you this. Some of you have been through unspeakable tragedy. Some of you have looked down in the scope of death. You've lost parents too early, children too soon, it seemed. Some of you have lost babies. Some of you have family that have been stricken with terrible malady and sickness and disease. I want to remind you that suffer together we're a fallen race we're a fallen people sin brought this situation and the only hope we have is to put our hope in him amen there's been a many of people that turned away from God <clears throat> they let loose their they, they, they said I can't serve a God like this I'm going to tell you, this same kind of God saw His Son go through unspeakable atrocities to bring salvation to you and to me. I would, I would ask you to read Fox's Book of Martyrs and see what some of our early church mothers and fathers went through to bring the gospel to you and I. Can I tell you that Paul spent a third of his life or more in prison? Can I tell you, he was beaten many times. Can I tell you, he suffered stripes on his back. Can I tell you, it wasn't fair. But he had the power of God in his life. When a, a viper bit him, he just shook him off. And, you know, it's crazy. Hebrews 11, I encourage you to read it. We find that the hall of faith right there, the hall of fame of the faith heroes, where some of them were sown asunder. What does that mean? 
They tied a rope around their arms and another rope around their ankles. Hooked it to a horse going that way and a horse going that way. And someone took a bull whip and popped them on the backside. And those horses ran and sewed asunder the children of God. Some of them they took knives and flayed alive. Some of them they stoned to death. Some of them they piled wood up and strapped them down and tied them and lit them up and burned them at the stake. Some of them they dipped in boiling oil. Some of them, did you know, all, all of the disciples except John was martyred. John's the only one that survived and, and they boiled him in oil but he wouldn't cook. God, why does God miraculously deliver John? Well, we know sitting at the table, he, Jesus said of his own mouth that he was his favorite disciple. So I, God, that ain't fair. Why did they crucify Peter upside down? Why did they uh, shove spears through Thomas? What, what's up with that, God? I'm going to tell you, we don't have to understand it all. You don't have to understand it all. And I'll just be frank with you. you you're not going to understand everything on this side. But here's, here's the deal. I've put my hand in His hand. His Word has, is, and will continue to be fulfilled. You can take that to the bank. And that is enough, my friend, for me to put my hope and my trust in Him. Would you bow with me right now? Lord, I know that there's people right now that have had unspeakable tragedy in their life.